we saw this transformative agenda as going way beyond the narrow confines of equal rights. So basically, if you ask for equality, you're asking for equal rights for a marginalized, discriminated community within the status quo that exists. And our argument was the status quo is wrong. You know, who wants equality within an unjust system? We want to transform the system to liberate everyone. Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. A few quick notes before we get started with today's episode. Last week's episode, Republicanism with Professor Philip Pettit, we got a really positive response from that. A few philosophy departments actually shared it on their social media, recommending it as a well-structured guide to the topic of Republican liberty. So thank you so much for doing that. And if you are someone in a philosophy department who thinks one of these episodes or conversations is valuable, please do share in that way. They're, they're intended to be resources for people learning about philosophy, whether they're students of it or just hobbyists. So thank you for the positive feedback for that one. That was really awesome. Next note is... For next week's episode, I'm going to try something a bit different and do an Ask Me Anything episode. So I got this idea from Sam Harris's podcast, which I listen to from time to time. And we've been getting a whole load of comments, some of them really intelligent and insightful questions. Specifically, my conversation with um, YouTube personality Aaron Ra on feminism has generated a fair amount of heat and some light, and my discussion and arguments that I made with Professor Cecile Farb from Oxford on legalising sex work and creating a commercial market for human organs, that's generated a lot of comments and questions as well. So rather than trying to address them all here, I'm going to do one episode which is just exclusively dedicated to answering listener questions. And if you have questions on any of the other episodes or on this upcoming episode, please do post them to our social media or to Reddit. I usually post these episodes to the philosophy subgroup in Reddit. So if there's a question that's occurred to you in one of these episodes, type it in and I'll get to as many as I can on next week's episode. Today's guest will be the UK's leading gay rights campaigner, Peter Tatchell. Peter has been called, quote, one of the most influential gay men of the century by The Independent on Sunday and a national hero by The Sunday Times. He's also been called a homosexual terrorist, that's a quote, by The Daily Mail, which is a hard-right British paper maybe something like a British Fox News, to provide a comparison. So, I personally would wear that one as a badge of honour. As a bio, Peter's done a huge amount of amazing and important and life-changing work in his life. I'm only going to be able to give a quick sample here, but in short, he's been campaigning for human rights, democracy, LGBT freedom and global justice since 1967. He was a member of the queer human rights group Outrage, and is a member of the Green Party in the UK. He's uh, the founder of the Peter Tatchell Foundation, which campaigns for human rights globally. Peter is the author of the world's first self-help guide for people living with HIV, titled AIDS, A Guide to Survival. Now, that was published in 1986, and was the first major publication to go against the idea that AIDS was necessarily a death sentence. Peter also authored Safer Sexy in 1994, which was the first comprehensive guide to having gay sex safely and pleasurably. Um, this book caused a lot of outrage for explicit uh, images of safe gay sex, and ran against Britain's uh, strict sexual censorship laws. One thing I really admire about Peter 
is a willingness not just to speak and challenge conventions, but really put his body on the line for the issues he cares about in a way that is incredibly brave and inspiring. And I'm just going to give you two examples of that out of many. The most famous is that in 1999, Peter performed a citizen's arrest of Robert Mugabe, the president of Zimbabwe. So under British law, a citizen can arrest and detain another citizen if they have strong reason to believe that that person has committed a crime. And Peter did this to Robert Mugabe, the Zimbabwean dictator, when he visited London, restrained him and held him until police arrived. At which time, of course, Peter and his companions were arrested and Mugabe was free to do his Christmas shopping in Harrods, although all charges against Peter were later dropped, which is kind of an awesome and amazing thing to do. He then did the same thing again to Mugabe some years later and got quite badly beaten by his bodyguards for his trouble. One final example, in March 2003, Peter jumped out in front of Tony Blair's car to protest the upcoming war in Iraq. He ran into the road in front of the car, holding a sign urging international aid to the Iraqi people, and Blair's car screeched to a halt just six inches from his legs. So, Peter is someone who has really lived his ideals, which is something I really, really admire and aspire to in myself, if not always live up to. He's currently a columnist for The Guardian, a British newspaper, as well as the host of the TV show Talking with Tatchell. So, there's a lot more I could say about Peter, but I want to just get straight to our conversation. So, without further preamble, it is my absolute pleasure to present Peter Tatchell. I am joined today by the UK's leading gay rights campaigner, Peter Tatchell. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Very pleased to join you. Great. So just before we get started, um, how would you, you've done so much over the years, um, you've run for office, you've campaigned on any number of issues. Do you have like a single sentence or two to describe what you do when people ask? Well, I guess you could say that I am a universal human rights campaigner. For me, LGBT rights is one part of the spectrum of human rights. And I see all the different human rights issues and struggles as interconnected. They're all about the liberation of the individual, the community, the wider public. And I think we need to try and recognize that instead of fighting our own small corners, which is often necessary, uh, we also need to find ways of building solidarity and links with each other to support our common struggle for a better society. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, um, you've probably, well, you might be into this particular weird online space, but I've spent a lot of time on the podcast arguing that different communities working for social justice need to stop turning cannons on their own fleet. Um, there's been some really loud online wars between atheists and non-believers and feminists, and I've spent a lot of my time arguing this is gratuitous and is not helping either community. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to start, though, with gay rights, and something you said, I was listening to some of your interviews from a little while ago that really interested me, is you said back in the day, meaning presumably the 70s or so, we never talked about equality, we talked about liberation, and that was the name of one of the early groups, right, the Gay Liberation Movement. Um, could you talk me through what, what you meant by that? Well, when I first began my human rights and LGBT campaigning in the 1960s, 
um, it was from a place of very grave oppression. Um, in many countries, many Western countries, homosexuality was still totally criminalized. You could be jailed, forced to undergo compulsory psychiatric treatment, sacked from your job, evicted from your home. But when I got involved in the early gay liberation movement, our agenda was very much about challenging that in a way that questioned and critiqued society. Uh, the word equality never passed our lips. Our concern was to transform society to not only liberate LGBT people, but also straight people as well. And we saw this transformative agenda as going way beyond the narrow confines of equal rights. Basically, if you ask for equality, you're asking for equal rights for a marginalized, discriminated community within the status quo that exists. And our argument was the status quo is wrong. You know, who wants equality within an unjust system? We want to transform the system to liberate everyone and to build alliances between different social movements so that we can all work together to change society for the benefit of all of us. Great, and that's so different from when I started doing social justice work. So I started, I don't know, about 10 years ago now, and I worked um, with and for the human rights campaign in America. And the primary thing we were arguing and advocating for was literally, and we called it, marriage equality. You know, that was the campaign, which I am still very proud of my involvement with. And I, I worked for them when the Supreme Court ruling came in on that. But I think we, we were so focused on the equality word because we'd heard so many times um, from people who didn't really understand what we were asking for. They would say, well, gay people are asking for special rights. And so we really just were conditioned to formulate our response as, no, we're not. We're asking for equal rights, the same rights. But the marriage one brings us to some of your views, which you've written that you think actually going for equality in marriage, and this goes to the liberation thing, isn't necessarily what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for a plurality of different types of arrangements that people can make. Um, did I sum that up right? And what would you want to add to that? More or less. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I am one of the people who began the campaign for marriage equality in the UK way back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and that is not because I was a fan of marriage. In fact, I share the feminist critique of, of marriage as a fundamentally patriarchal institution with a rather tragic, bad history of oppressing both women and LGBT people. But of course, I opposed discrimination in marriage law because it was homophobic. So even though I personally would not want to get married, even though I'm a critic of marriage, I opposed the ban on same-sex marriage because it was inspired by homophobic discrimination. But simultaneously, I also argued for an alternative both to marriage and to civil unions. Um, civil unions are, in essence, marriage by another name. The same basic template and model. What I was suggesting is that, yes, let's get rid of homophobic discrimination in marriage law, but let's also aspire to something bigger and better. So if we were starting from scratch, I doubt that people today would go for the marriage model. I think they'd try and find something that was more modern, egalitarian, flexible, and more attuned to modern people's loves and lifestyles. So, for example, uh, under my proposed alternative to marriage and civil unions, um, I've argued that anyone should be able to nominate any significant other person in their life as next of kin and beneficiary. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's discrimination against single people. There's only people in marriage or marriage-like relationships formalized by law who are allowed to automatically give next of kin status to their partner and to benefit from 
tax exemptions in terms of inheritance of uh, property and wealth. So that was the first part. The second part was to say that um, a person should be able to, uh, if they're in a relationship, they should be able to um, pick and mix from a menu of rights and responsibilities. Uh, with marriage and civil unions, it's one size fits all. You know, it's, it's, it's there written in law, there's no negotiation, you just sign. Under my system, you'd be able, the partners would be able to sit down and negotiate each individual point. So, you know, some people may want to have joint guardianship of children, others may not or may not have any children. Some may want to share their finances, others might want to maintain financial independence. Um, there's a whole host of different variations. So under my system, people will be able to pick a mix from a menu of rights and responsibilities to create a tailor-made partnership agreement suited to their particular needs. I think that's fairer and better. And also, I think it would actually help concentrate the mind because if partners have to sit down and negotiate each you know, aspect, each right and responsibility, I think they would be better apprised about what they were getting into. So it might lead to wiser, more responsible, enduring decisions. So I'm not saying that this idea of mine is the be all and end all, but I'm just saying it's, it's perhaps the beginnings of a of a debate about alternatives to marriage and civil unions. And I think, you know, we should not assume that what's been handed down to us by, by, to us by history is what should stay, what should be here forever. Yeah, so a thought and a question. I think the thought is when I was certainly my own support for marriage equality, if we want to use that phrase, has never been a support for marriage per se. Um, I am married, but that's just because we want to be able to live in both countries. You know, it makes that a lot easier. Um, the, my support always came from it in that marriage is one of those things that having access to is symbolic, of much like having the vote or something like that. It's symbolic of an equal moral worth and an equal social worth as a citizen, and its denial to certain communities is symbolic as well for that reason. It's like something, I think, where symbolism matters and really causes pain. My, my question then would be, what role, if any, would you give in your worldview for tradition? Because I can just hear some conservatives saying, well, look, people have been getting married this way for all of human history. It's a core foundation of society. And maybe we can accommodate expanding that circle a bit to include gay people or you know trans people or whatever but now you just want to really completely move away from it altogether what would you sort of and and they might say who knows what's coming down the line they might say we're already having higher divorce rates um all sorts of like what they see as problematic social breakdown would this only lead to more of that surely we should stay with what we know and trust i don't agree with that but i can imagine someone saying it well, I'm not proposing to abolish marriage or civil union, although some people might like to do, but I'm not. I'm saying this alternative would be an addition to what currently exists to give people a third option um, and to try and create a system that will work for and have the confidence of people who are not enamored of marriage and civil unions. Um, you know, I do share the feminist critique of marriage and its marriage-like option, civil unions. Um, I, I think that that is a system based on history and tradition, not on what actually fits many people's uh, real lived lives today. So all I'm saying is for those who are not, you know, captivated by this traditional system of relationship recognition, give them an alternative. So, yeah, it's an interesting contradiction, though, because almost all of our traditions come from a less tolerant time and carry with them the sort of seeds of that. But then you still have to live in the world that's 
built by them. So I remember when I got married, I had this idea of I was going to translate the, the service from the Book of Common Prayer into contemporary English. And so instead of till death, death do you part, we vowed until separated by death. So just like a modern English rendition. And I was amazed by how much of it was explicitly about the fornication and the sexual congress and the rearing of children. And it, it really was like language of use for like cattle and stuff like that. It was quite amazing. Um, but then at the same time, even though I completely agree with the feminist tradition of marriage, I still wanted to do it because it does confer certain rights and privileges. And it was very nice to get all of our families together for a big do, and it was an important turning point for our lives. I don't know if you have any thoughts or advice to the younger generation about how you square the circle of being aware as a matter of history how problematic these things can be but then still living in the world where you have sort of certain social expectations and commitments placed upon you? Well, I think a lot of people do like forms of ritual, mm. of which marriage or civil union are one, and of which, you know, my alternative model of relationship recognition and rights could be another. So you can still have the great family get together with friends, family, loved ones. Um, but it's just trying to reframe the framework of law, of rights and responsibilities in a different way. I mean, you know, today in modern societies, there are huge varieties of relationships. I mean, some partners live together, some live apart, some share their finances, others maintain financial independence, some have kids, others don't. So my model is trying to accommodate all those different variations and at the same time give people a genuine choice about what rights and what responsibilities they want to enter into and commit to. Which I think is a good answer. I think that's probably what defines us as people of the left is we view social progress as charting new ground. You can go to new places, you can have new models and modes of discourse. Whereas conservatives always tend to view it as a reversion to some sort of, we've got to get back to the traditional family, whatever that means. Okay, moving so, on. But, yeah, those go ahead. Marriage and civil unions, I mean, I wish them well. You know, I, I don't <laughs> agree with them, but I wish them well, and I'll, I'll defend absolutely their right. And I champion the, the right of same sex couples to get married, mm. despite my own personal reservations about the institution. So it's not about me trying to impose my will on others. Mm. It's just coming up with an all different alternative model and opening it up for people who want to take advantage of it. Do you think it would be popular? I could well have seen myself going down, if that had been an option on the table. I could easily see myself having done that. Do you think a lot of people would? Well, when I've spoken and written about the idea, there's been a sizable minority of people who've said, yeah, that, that sounds more like me. That sounds the kind of relationship framework that I would like. Now, there are others who say, no, 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 marriage is the gold standard. Yeah. And that's fine for them as well. You know, I think that the, the point is, is to give people options and choices and not force them into particular traditional ideas about what constitutes a legally valid relationship. One final thing I can imagine, I've heard a lot of libertarians in particular say the government should have no role in marriage at all. People can just form whatever contracts they want with each other. Um, would you agree with that point of view? Well, they can up to a point, hmm. but no amount of contractual agreement and obligation between two people can get around uh, the, the inheritance, tax and social security laws that prevail with regard to single people versus those in relationships. Also stuff like um, immigrating to a different country, care of children, stuff like that. I mean, um, the people... And, yeah. and a, a, a contract does not of itself um, necessarily deal with some of the problems that can result from an ugly breakup. Yeah. So we, we have a system of law governing relationships for those who want it, precisely in order to cater for those unforeseen circumstances 
uh, those circumstances where perhaps a more vulnerable partner could be left high and dry by the other partner. Yeah. So staying with the theme of liberation, one area where I think it's super clear that what you wouldn't want in it is equality is um, sex education. If, if the, the goal of gay liberation is that um, uh, gay people, gay sex is covered as well in sex education as heterosexual sex, then that would still be a pretty sad outcome, right? Absolutely. The levels of sex education across the board in most British schools is woefully inadequate. And young people say this themselves. It's not me making that point, it's young people saying we're not getting enough information. The sex education is mostly biological, it's about reproduction, it's not about human relationships, it's not about things like how to deal with problems in a relationship. Uh, the emotional side is largely ignored. And it's certainly not about how to have um, good quality sex, how to satisfy your partner, you know, the, all the issues about sexual techniques, um, the things that are the building blocks of a happy, fulfilled relationship. Um, we all know that for most people, um, the person they love and have a relationship is one of the most important things in their lives. Yet we also know that many surveys show that many couples are emotionally and sexually unfulfilled and i'm not saying teaching about these issues in schools is a panacea but certainly we do know that in countries or in particular schools in britain where this has been trialed the upshot is first of all wiser more responsible sexual behavior by young people fewer teenage pregnancies and abortions lower rates of sexually transmitted infections including hiv and a higher level of sexual and emotional satisfaction in relationships. So all these different outcomes point to the fact that early good quality sex and relationship education is good for the individual, the couple, and the wider society. Because happy, fulfilled couples and relationships makes for a better society. And I just think it's really weird that anybody would want equality within what currently exists in sexual and relationship education, given how woefully inadequate it mostly is. Whereas if the goal was liberation, it's liberation to have, it's not just freedom to be left alone, it's freedom to have a good and meaningful and fulfilled life. That may not involve sex, but for most people it probably will. One thing you said that absolutely, I just watched your talk on this, um, that absolutely jumped out at me, and I can imagine some conservative Christian mother losing their ever-loving mind over this, is you said, let's teach people about forms of sex other than intercourse. Let's teach people about oral sex, about manual sex, about all the different types of sex that don't involve risk of pregnancy and involve, if not a, a zero, a significantly reduced chance of infection. And I can just, I can just hear some outraged housewife going, you want to teach my daughter about oral sex? And your answer would be yes, right? Absolutely. And when I've spoken about this publicly, um, it has initially provoked outrage. But then I've turned to the parents and said, look, you as a parent want the best for your child. You know that sexual intercourse carries higher risks than oral sex and mutual masturbation. Surely you would prefer your child to engage in low risk behavior rather than high risk behavior. Surely you want your child to know and understand about safer sex. And sometimes, not every time, but sometimes they calm down and then there's a conversation. But you're right, the initial knee jerk reaction from many parents is shock and horror. But when you actually have the conversation, they're less shocked than horrified. They're, they're more open to uh, consideration. And we do know that um, in among young people who do have um, oral sex and mutual masturbation, um, the levels of uh, unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections is much lower. And that surely is a good thing. 
You'd think, but I mean, so I live in America and decades worth of data and research showing in as clearly as you will ever get a result in the social sciences that abstinence only education makes every outcome you, you even if all you cared about wasn't people's well-being if all you cared about was reducing stis and um, unwanted pregnancies every bit of data we have shows that abstinence only or, or a more reductive approach makes those outcomes worse and it hasn't moved a fairly significant block of people. There does seem to be a group of people who are just unreachable to these arguments. Well, I always say to everyone, I don't encourage young people to have sex. I think it's best if they wait. And for me, speaking personally, sex is usually better and more fulfilling within the context of a relationship. But that's not the way lots of young people think and behave. And so how can we focus on harm reduction? How can we reduce the chances of them doing themselves and their partners harm? How can we, in particular, reduce the levels of teen pregnancies and abortions and sexual infections? And if promoting alternatives to intercourse is one way to do it, then surely that is in the interest and the welfare of young people. Yeah, I think there's just a natural fear people have of putting children and sex in the same sentence, much less in the same room together. Um, but we can't let that fear override what are the right choices for our children. I think there's also this thing where people think they own their children. Like, I would really want to say to them, you don't. People say, I, I get to decide what happens to my child. Well, actually, up to a point, no, you don't. You don't get to beat your child, for instance. And I would say, no, maybe you don't get to deny them the information that would lead them to have a happy and fulfilled life. Yeah, and, and in this day and age, when we are rightly concerned about the shocking levels of child sexual abuse, to keep young people in ignorance about sex colludes with their abusers. And I find it so shocking that in British schools, there are very few examples of schools who actually talk to their kids about sexual abuse issues. You know, quite a few will say, well, phone child line, but that's, that's not good enough. I mean, phoning child line, uh, which is a, a, a helpline for young people who have whatever problems they have, um, that's fine, but it's clearly not adequate. And the problem is that sexual abusers rely on guilt and shame about sex in order to continue their abuse. Exactly. Young, young people who are unconfident about talking about sex, who feel guilt and shame, will be less likely to say no to abusers, less likely to speak out to their teachers or parents about abuse. They will keep it all hidden, which is exactly what the abuser wants. So challenging sexual guilt and shame is part of the armory of protecting and empowering young people against sexual abuse. So I have one final question about young people and sex, and you know, there's a line to take out of context, um, but what do you make of, I've been reading some statistics recently that the youngest generation, so people coming of age who are say, I don't know, 18 to 24 or so now, are actually having significantly less sex, both less sexual encounters overall and also less sexual partners than than my generation, um, I'm 30 now, and as well as, as my parents' generation. Now, that doesn't strike me as necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, you, you might have very good reasons to decide not to have sex. But it is interesting, because the narrative we get is that this is a very over-sexed generation. They're a generation who's being taught sex by porn, which is probably partly true. What, what do you make of the fact that, that the amount of sex younger people are having seems to be going down and quite sharply down well that is their right you know you know if you don't want to have sex if you you know want to save yourself that's absolutely your choice and i'll defend it but as we all know um sex is an intrinsic part of the human condition it's the source of you know both immense pleasure and sometimes friction in relationships so let's find ways in which we can make it better for both partners. 
And so that means creating a culture where people understand their sexual rights, which include the right to say no, as well as the right to say yes. Um, they understand their sexual responsibilities, that sex isn't just about me, 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 it's about a mutual thing, mutual consent, respect and fulfillment. Um, but if at the end of the day people decide, no, I don't want to have sex, that's, that's their choice. You know, that, that's fine. But again, give them the options. Don't make them feel that they're pressured to have sex or pressured to not have sex. Yeah. One final thought here is, um, I'll speak only actually for the straight community. Um, like, I, um, I'm straight, so I'm not going to talk about gay sex as something I don't really know about. But, like, how bad the sex, I'm not even talking about, like, non-consensual sex, but how, like, not satisfying sex seems to be for a lot of people a lot of the time. And most of my friends in life, whether it's been uh, romantic or not, have been women. And when they tell me about their encounters, I'm not claiming to be any sort of um, sexual mastermind, but it just they just seem, at very best, incredibly boring. And incredibly, like, people could just literally, like you say, be stand to be trained on sexual technique. Um, could stand to be taught things like, hey... Maybe the first time you sleep with someone, it's a good idea to not be blindingly drunk or on drugs. One, all the misunderstandings about consent occur that way. But two, it's just not great sex, usually. And it does really strike me that, I mean, obviously, especially for gay or non-conforming people where there's more of a stigma, but even for straight people, like a few basic lessons in sexual technique and in, like, how to have sex that's gratifying for both parties could go a long way here. Well, we know in Britain that um, there have been innumerable surveys over the years which show that there are fairly modest levels of sexual and emotional uh, satisfaction in both casual and married relationships. That a significant proportion of, of married couples say they don't feel sexually and emotionally fulfilled. And you're right, that is often because their partners don't you know, listen, that they don't understand, they've never been told. And I think, you know, you know, with young boys, for example, you know, the clitoris is like, you know, <laughs> what, what is, you know, what is the clitoris? Where is the clitoris? You know, um, I remember I did a couple of lessons and the number of boys who, who knew what the clitoris was and where it was, was very, very low, about 10% out of a class of about um, 100 so I think just those kind of basic things. Um, and I think it is, it is often the case that women in particular feel sexually and particularly emotionally unfulfilled by sex. And that is partly about challenging ignorance and, and partly knowledge. It's partly about also challenging macho attitudes among some young men. Um, this macho bravado sort of attitude towards sex the sex of conquest, you know, you know, the, the, the bragging, um, you know, it, it, it belies often a lack of sensitivity and mutuality in a relationship. And I think that needs to change. And I'm not saying schools are the panacea, but schools are a good place to start. And where this kind of education has been trialed, it does seem to have improved things significantly. I remember the first moment I realised I was a feminist, although I probably wouldn't have used the word or known to have used it then, was I remember in high school, about 16, talking to my male friends about sex, so not a promising start here, and I remember all of them getting visibly upset that their girlfriends wouldn't go as far with them as they wanted, but then in the same breath turn around and slut shame a woman who did. So in the same breath, complaining about, like, their girlfriends, oh, she won't go, she won't do this with me, she won't do that. Oh, but her, she's a complete slag. She's what, and talking about her in the most horrible terms. And I just thought, well, you're, you're creating a stick for your own back there, my friend. Like, you're, you're not, obviously women are the victims of that in terms of their, they have this horrible, impossible thing of they have to both be nagged for sex, but also held to a chastity standard. But also I look, remember just looking to guys and saying, hey, if you want to have happy sex lives, stop 
shaming women who want to participate in them. And I've, that, like, the number of times I've had that thought where I see men, you know, usually straight white men, perpetrating, like, attitudes about women who choose to be promiscuous. And I just think you are not making your own life easier, my friend. You're not going to be making your own sex life better. And some men can hear that and some really can't. I don't know. Yeah, I think um, in Britain we have what's called the lag culture, which sort of that attitude is typical of. But we also have the ladette culture, where some young women uh, mimic it from a woman's perspective. But the same kind of, you know, bravado and shaming and, you know, complaining about their partners. Um, so I think, you know, we really need to try and um, create an education system which prepares young people as a school system is supposed to for adult life. And one aspect of adult life, and a very important one for most people, is sex and relationships. And the idea that people should be literate in English and maths, but not in sex and relationships, strikes me as absurd. Yeah, I I agree. You're preaching to the choir here. Um, okay, um, t- returning back to our theme of um, liberation versus equality, from the time in the 60s when you started campaigning under obviously much worse oppression, it was very much about liberation. Through to the time when I started campaigning um, on these issues, it was all about equality. What changed over that period do you think that i mean obviously we won a great many victories and things got better if not perfect but what what about on what changed that our narrative changed and the, the goals we were purporting to work for changed do you think well i think the lgbt liberation movements that grew up in britain the united states and other western countries in the late 60s early 1970s was very much a uh, movement of that era of 1960s idealism and radicalism when authority and tradition was being challenged left, right and centre. And so you had the rise of the Black Liberation Movement, the Women's Liberation Movement and the LGBT Liberation Movement as well. And all these movements were about taking on people in power and authority challenging laws and traditions, um, taking on social institutions which marginalise respectively black people, women and LGBT people. Um, I think what happened is that some people in that movement found the quest for a liberation agenda, for a social transformation, was too big an ask. And they thought, let's lower our horizons to the more limited goal of equality. Um, Equality has got a better ring to it, got more popular appeal. It's more achievable than transforming society. So we had this sort of, what I would call, lowering of, of expectations and hopes and aspirations to the more limited goal of equal rights within society as it existed. And of course, that was fueled by um, the fact that um, more and more LGBT people began to professionally get into positions of power um, where they had to play the system or conform to the system. Um, It meant that, you know, lots of people who perhaps previously were in the gay liberation movement um, thought, well, you know, that's, that's a big ask. Uh, we're not making much progress. I don't think we will make progress. Let, let's go for, you know, equal employment rights, um, you know, an end to criminalization, all those kind of basic human rights and equality agenda. I can understand that to a point. I don't, I don't think the two are necessarily mutually exclusive. I think the big danger of the equality agenda is that it can ultimately lead to the collapse of the movement. So if you take the struggle of African-Americans as a good example, 
it was all premised on equal rights, on equal voting rights, on an end to segregation in the Deep South. And once those narrow equal rights goals were won, the movement collapsed. Yet here we are, well more than a half a century later, and you could reasonably argue that in some parts of America, informal segregation between communities based on race is almost as bad as it was in the 50s and 60s. And there's a whole section of the African-American population who are locked out of economic prosperity and success. Or physically in... locked up in prisons, yeah. which we have the most of the world of. So. Yeah. But, you know, I think, you know, prisons, but also just, you know, run down inner city communities with uh, few options and uh, few choices. So look at it that way, and, and you could see that you know, racism hasn't gone away. Racial injustice is still with us. But what we have now is no coherent organized movement. And even though the laws have changed, and in many ways the institutions, except perhaps the police, have changed, um, African Americans still get a raw deal. You know, that they're still not truly and genuinely respected and accepted. Um, you know, there still isn't you know, the kind of things that Martin Luther King aspired to. That, that's why he, of course, you know, particularly towards the end of his life, um, focused on economic justice. He said that was a key element of the struggle for black rights, that mere equality within the law based on race was not adequate, that so many African Americans were suffering and marginalized because of economic injustice, because of class inequality, and the closure of uh, opportunities for low, low, low incomes. And I think we're seeing a very similar um, scenario with the LGBT movement. In Britain today, you know, we started off in 1999 with having more, by, by volume, the largest number of anti-gay law, laws of any country in the world, some of them dating back centuries. Today we have some of the best laws. Mm. That's been a fantastic, phenomenal, extraordinary achievement. It's the fastest, most successful uh, law reform campaign in British and possibly world history. I can't think of another example where so many laws have been repealed in such a short space of time, in less than two decades. But the consequence of that is that the movement and its institutions have largely collapsed. You know, there are still some organizations but nowhere num the numbers and the scale of two decades ago. And yet there are so many issues that still remain that need to be addressed, and there is not the organizational and movement infrastructure to address many of them. But there's also not the, there's not the vision as well. There's not the where do we want to go and what do we want to be. If the vision is just, well, you know, it'll all still be the same social structure, but... Of the people in the boardroom of the big corporation making all the decisions, there'll be a few gay people there and a few women as well. If that's the vision, I can understand activists not being particularly compelled to really go and risk and fight for it. I, I almost disagree. I think equality might be broader and have a broader appeal. I think liberation, yes, more challenging, yes, more difficult, and yes, maybe ultimately in its total fulfillment impossible might be more inspiring as a way of talking to people I don't know, I, I, I can see people being more inspired by liberation than by equality Well, I think different people will be inspired in different ways and I don't want to dismiss or disparage those who are stuck with the equality mantra all I'm saying is I don't think it's adequate and I don't think it has you know fulfilled our objectives. Um, and there are lots of issues, of course, within our own community that have got nothing to do with equality, mm. you know, or, or, or very little to do with equality, you know, you know, um, chemsex parties and the rise in HIV and other sexually transmitted mm. infections. Um, of course, it has something to do with equality, but essentially not. This is about how we treat each other within our community and the, the culture that we ourselves have created. Um, you know, 
Likewise, um, if you look at rates of mental illness within our communities, a lot of it does relate to homophobia, mm. but our response is actually quite weak. You know, there, there are very few organizations in the LGBT community in Britain that address mental health issues affecting LGBT people. Very, very few. And yet it's a, it's a major, major issue. And that's because we put all our eggs in the basket of equality and law reform rather than looking at LGBT lives in the round and the fact that many of the issues and uh, problems we face cannot simply be reduced to matters of equal rights and legal equality. We also seem to have ceded liberty, freedom, liberation to the right. That's now become one of their big things. We've become exclusively about equality, I think, to the detriment of our overall vision. Obviously, equality plays a role, but it shouldn't be the only thing. But when I look at the right right now, particularly the far right, they seem to be obsessed with championing free speech, and it always invariably comes down to the free speech of someone saying something disgusting and hateful. How do you respond to that? Because my, I do see some liberals just like almost jumping into the chalk outline of a body and saying, yeah, you know what, your free speech doesn't override my right not to be discriminated against. I think that's a mistake. I think there's a better and fuller defense of free speech and freedom in general we can give where we can say, yeah, absolutely we agree with free speech, even for the bigots, but I'm not really concerned with them. I'm concerned with... Um, I follow quite a few trans commentators, uh, transgender commentators online. Every single one of them gets multiple, multiple death threats for their work. I'm much more concerned with that assault of, on freedom of speech than of the right to some far-right commentator to speak on a college campus without getting protests. I'd love to get your thoughts on that as a final issue. Well, I think that all bigoted ideas, whether they pertain to race, gender, disability, sexuality, or gender identity, they should all be challenged. Mm -hmm. They should never be given a free pass. But I would reserve my red lines on free speech to three scenarios. Um, first of all, uh, where someone is um, making false damaging allegations. So as a way of scoring a point, you know, falsely claiming or concocting a story that a person is a racist or a paedophile or a tax fraudster, you know, that is not free speech. That's an abuse of free speech and no one should be allowed to do that. Equally, if someone uh, is engaging in persistent uh, harassment, menaces and threats, now that's also an abuse of free speech. And the final red line for me is where people in, incite, encourage, or glorify violence against other human beings. Um, those three scenarios, um, some people will say they are free speech. I would say they're an abuse of free speech, which actually closes down free speech, because people who are victims in those ways will be silenced. Mm -hmm. They'll be fearful. They won't participate in the public debate because they will fear the consequences. Um, so, for example, when I was involved in the Stop Murder Music campaign um, against the eight Jamaican reggae and dancehall singers who advocated killing LGBT people, uh, I was often accused by critics of censoring them, you know, wanting to censor them and close down their right to free speech. Well, first of all, incitement to violence is a serious criminal offence, and quite rightly so. It's not free speech, it's a crime. And secondly, uh, these murder music lyrics and those who advocated them intimidated black, particularly in, in the Caribbean, uh, black LGBT people from you know, putting their head above the parapet and speaking out against murder music because they were afraid that they would be killed. So I do think that there are those three circumstances where free speech can be legitimately limited in order to preserve genuine free speech for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I obviously agree. We're coming up on time. Final, final, final question. Um, 
what's your views, I just read your article on this, of people who claim free speech as a way to deny service? So there's been cases in both the UK and the US of people not wanting to provide wedding cakes, flowers, stuff like that for gay weddings. I sort of think... And part of me wants to say, just bake the damn cake already. And then part of me wants to say, well, you're an idiot and a bigot, but that's your right. Where do you fall on that? Well, I don't think anyone has a right to discriminate against a person Mm -hmm. by refusing to provide a service because of their race, gender, sexuality, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, That's clearly discrimination. And in a free and open society, we can't have people unilaterally deciding I'm not going to serve this person because they're Jewish or Muslim, because they're black or gay. Uh, That's unacceptable. But where I think it is legitimate is I don't think anyone should be compelled to promote political messages with which they disagree. So, for example, um, I have opposed the prosecution of the Ashes Bakery in Northern Ireland who did not refuse to serve Gareth Lee because he was a gay man, they refused to put on his cake the message, support gay marriage. Now, I'm really sad they took that stand. You know, they are bigots, they're homophobes. But I don't think they should be compelled to decorate the cake with that message um, to which they had a conscience objection. A misguided conscience objection, but a conscience objection nonetheless. In the same sense, I don't think a gay baker should be forced to make a cake with a message, um, you know, gays are whatever, you know, some abusive homophobic message. Yeah, that seems like the right line to draw to me. I mean, it's ridiculous that that's where he chose to use his political courage, but whatever. Um, Okay, great. That's time. I know you have to get going. Um, Just finally, if people want to follow you or support your work, where should they go? They can go to a website of my foundation, uh, the Peter Tatchell Foundation, which is www.petertatchellfoundation.org or follow us on Twitter, either my personal Twitter, at Peter Tatchell, or the foundation Twitter, at PT underscore foundation. Okay. Uh, we've also got Facebook as well. Um, but you'd be most welcome. You can sign up. It's all free. Um, and I think and hope you'll find some interesting ideas there. Um, you may not agree with all of them, but I think they'll give you some food for thought. Um, and I'll just finish off with my motto and message, uh, which is um, which motivates my work. Um, it's very simple don't accept the world as it is, dream of what the world could be, and then help make it happen. Fantastic. Um, Listen, Peter, I really, really appreciate you doing this. I've loved our chat. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you, and best wishes to you and all your listeners. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and follow. Links to all of that are on our website, politicalphilosophypodcast.com. So, all one word, politicalphilosophypodcast.com. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. You can subscribe to our SoundCloud account or follow our RSS feed. And in terms of following us on social media, we're up on Facebook and Twitter where I post all of the new shows, updates about guests, as well as other talks and projects on politics and philosophy that might be interesting. So again, lots of great new content. We have a new show coming out every week. Links to all of that are on our website, politicalphilosophypodcast.com. And please do follow, because we have a lot of great guests coming up. Next week's episode, as I mentioned in the beginning, will be an Ask Me Anything, After that, I'll be talking with Mandisa Thomas, the president of Black Nonbelievers in the US. I'll also be talking to Professor Will McCaskill, an Oxford professor of moral philosophy and the founder of the moral altruism movement. I'll be having a multi-part series on Christianity, postmodernism, and New Testament history with the Yale historian Dale B. Martin, 
And I also have some projects of collaboration coming up with other politics and philosophy podcasters, where we're going to record some stuff together. So lots of really cool stuff coming up. Please do follow and stay tuned. Once again, thank you for listening, and thank you really so much to everyone who's helped grow our audience by sharing episodes. If you do want to support the podcast, which is a free project done just for passion, the best way you can do that is to help get the word out there by forwarding or sharing. So, thanks again for listening, and until next time. 